Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and the seventh episode in our prerequisite course series. And this one, we're going to talk about how to start sharpening your tools. Because, in case you didn't know it, everything you do in the craft is designed to efficiently dull your tools. And if you can't sharpen, you just can't woodwork. Now, I was in the same boat as a lot of y'all starting out. And then sharpening kind of seemed like a black art to me. And a lot of the people that were telling, teaching how to sharpen seemed like cult fanatics. I mean, the vigor with them saying that this is the only way to accomplish a certain task was extreme. And a lot of the times it was you needed to buy something specific in order to sharpen the way they do. So you always had to take everything you read with a grain of salt. Even the stuff that I'm about to say now. Uh, I might be advocating one way or the other simply because it works for me. But a lot of times that also means that I spent my money a certain way and maybe I am just validating my choice the way I spent money. But no matter what you do, sharpening comes down to one very Simple philosophy. You have two angles. And they have got to meet for infinity. Those rays have to extend out. No matter how much you put it under a magnifying glass, it's always going to look the same. Two rays going to infinity. If you ever have any kind of curve on the end, it's a dull tool. Even if you have magnified down to you know, 12,000 uh, magnification, if there's a roundness, it is a dull tool. Now that might be so minutely dull that it doesn't really matter. And there, that's a key factor. Because while a lot of times you see people advocating for getting the ultimate sharpness in their tool, many times it's just not that necessary to get a specific task done. A carpenter does not need the same sharpness as a letter carver. Neither does a furniture maker. A power tool, like my lathe, I sharpen on a 180 grit wheel. I would never sharpen that, my chisel, that I'm using hand pressure to make smooth cuts. The power of the lathe compensates for a little bit of dullness. Same with your bandsaw, your table saw. Those tools typically are not going to be as sharp as a fine hand tool that you're getting the ultimate finish off of. But then again, they don't need to be. And because all sharpening comes down to just getting two planes going forever into infinity, you really only need to adopt one or two methods of sharpening to reach that task. Now, I will tell you this. All of sharpening in my mind comes down to doing three things. To get a sharp tool you can either sand to an edge, you can slice to an edge, or you can smush to an edge. Sanding isn't some kind of abrasion and that's either done with sandpapers or some kind of stone or wheel. Slicing a lot of times is something used with something like a mill file and if you've ever sharpen your lawnmower blade with this right here, you're basically taking thin slices of metal off to create that edge. And then smushing is something like you would do with a card scraper, where you're actually folding metal until you get a perfect edge. So let's start talking about sanding. Now when we're talking about braiding, we're either talking about using some kind of sandpaper or a stone, be it a water stone, oil stone, or nowadays a lot of times we're talking about DMT or uh, diamond stones. And I'm going to be basically talking about woodworking tools that I use around the bench. I do know that attaching sandpaper to some kind of flat substrate, be it a piece of float glass or a, a marble tile or anything like that, is a very inexpensive way to get into the realm of sharpening. It's also the most expensive way to stay in the realm of sharpening. But it is completely valid. I know Deneb, uh, or the Lee Valley people that do those hand tool schools, every time they set up, he brings out, you know, his big 
marble, scientifically flattened block, and he has several rolls of sandpaper. And he will spritz down that block, lay out a roll, rip it off, and he will spend all day long doing sharpening demonstrations, maintaining the edges of all the tools that they have at the show for customers to try out and use. And he just uses that as a demonstration opportunity. He is using basically the scary sharp method. But I am willing to bet he goes through a hundred bucks of sandpaper in a weekend doing all those demos. Because he might sharpen one or two tools, then he rips it off, takes some kind of edge and gets all the glue off, re-spritzes it down with contact thing, puts on another piece of sandpaper, and goes at it again. It's that idea that you're running through sandpaper quite often that creates the expense. But the fact that Lee Nielsen is doing that for their demonstration tells you that this is a very valid method of sharpening stuff. I just think that he does it because he can get very crisp edges or he can abrade a lot of material quickly with the different grits and he maintains a fresh grit all the time. And it's not that messy because you're not getting a lot of uh, slurry from either the grits coming off of stones and stuff like that, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. All you're really getting is the metal shadings, which he can wipe away with a rag. I'm actually going to skip recommending the Scary Sharp method for somebody just getting started out, because in my personal opinion, it's a money pit. You're constantly needing to buy sandpaper, and the grit you need, you've always run out with. It's a big headache. And the idea that setting it up to begin with, you know, all you need is a piece of glass, some, uh, uh, some adhesive, and some sandpaper. Well, you know, that can of adhesive is going to run you seven, three to seven dollars. All that sandpaper you're going to want to buy to have some back stock of it. And if you're just getting into the craft, actually finding a piece of good float glass or going to the hardware store to buy a nice piece of granite or marble. I always get those two mixed up. Well, there's some expense there. Whereas buying one stone that has a coarse on one side and a fine on another, that might run, I want to say I paid $24 when I first got this, this particular one. This is the stone I first started sharpening with uh, 10, 12 years ago in that apartment I had. And this is a Norton Waterstone. It's a man-made product. It is not a natural stone, which has its plus and minuses, which I'll go away with, uh, with you. But the expense of buying one stone and not having to do any of that hassle of setting up and collecting those pieces just makes this a great entry-level way into the realm of sharpening the tools we would use at a workbench. But water stones aren't the only tile stones. You will commonly see people refer to uh, oil stones. Uh, a lot of times in this country, we refer to them as hard Arkansas or soft Arkansas. The soft being the coarser of the two. Now these, they come in different colors because a lot of these are natural stones. They literally go pick up a rock out of the river bed. They will crack it open and flatten it, and there's where you get your stones. And a lot of old-time grand grandfathers, they might have one oil stone in their toolkit, and they've got a nice wooden box. They cover it up. They really protect them. When they sharpen, they open it up, squirt a little, some kind of, some people would use kerosene or sharpening, lapping oil, and they would do their little dance across the stone, sharpening different levels. Now, natural stones, oil stones, stuff like that, they don't require flattening as often. That is the biggest downside I know of of water stones, whether they being the man-made ones or something like the Japanese water stones, which a lot of times are natural stones that are a little bit softer than the oil stones we use in this country. These require a liquid and they work by, as you work them, they break off the top layer of abrasive to refill fresh stones underneath. So you're constantly wearing these down to get nice crisp edges of new stones going down beneath them. And that creates not only the mess of the slurry, but the mess of the uh, shavings and stuff like that, which is why a lot of times people use these in what they call ponds or they'll put them in their slop sink 
to run water over them constantly as they sharpen them. I do know that some Japanese stones require a unique special stone. I forget what they call them. It begins with an N. But you actually prime them up to break off that top layer and it creates a slurry of both the material on this this stone and that stone and it's a slurry that free floating abrasives that actually does the sharpening and not so much the stone itself but as you can tell it is a bit of a messy process and it's also a wearing process the reason why you're constantly replacing sandpaper with the scary sharp method is because you are basically dulling the sandpaper as you go along. Well, with water stones, you're dulling the top layer and then removing it to expose the bottom layer, which means that they wear quite quickly, especially these man-made Norton ones that I, I tend to like, which means you're constantly having to flatten them. There's some maintenance involved with it. Now, there is an old trick that a lot of old timers, they would always carry three stones in their toolkit because if you have three surfaces that you rub together, eventually they will become completely flat because one will work off the high spots of the other and then you bring in a fresh one that has different high spots, it'll work off those and you go back and forth and you end up with a completely flat surface. In fact, that's actually how the Romans made mirrors. They would take a metal with abrasives and then they would do multiple versions to together uh, until they became mirror smooth. Side note. But with that in mind, when I first got into hand tool sharpening, I, as I said earlier, I bought the water stones and I got a combination stone because I read that the experts told me you wanted one fairly coarse grip, a thousand grit in the water stone uh, range, and one to polish it an 8,000 grit in that water stone range. I would tell you, to this day, I still think this is the best edges I ever got on my hand tools. Uh, that 8,000 grit just gave a wonderful polish that I do not get with what I'm currently using, which is diamond stones. And the reason why I went with diamond stones over this fairly inexpensive and efficient way of doing it was because I did all try to open up a woodworking school and the thing about diamonds, whether you buy an inexpensive set like I use in my travel kit, this is a 1200 grit and a 400 grit, one for shaping, one for sharpening. FYI, you'll see people talk about grits and stuff like that. You see, it doesn't seem that consistent a lot of times because 1200 grit is super fine in one manufacturer but it is medium in another manufacturer. But it comes down to what kind of finish you're getting on your edges. And this one gives me a somewhat grayish polished finish. You can see a reflection, but it's somewhat muddled. It's not like a mirror finish. I get a mirror finish with another step. But this is a small enough set that I can carry around with me in my portable kit uh, in case I damage an edge or if I just want to uh, reestablish an edge. But for the school, I bought a complete set of coarse, medium, fine, and super, super fine. And the advantage of this is it's not very messy. The only mess you have is what of whatever kind of lubricant you use. I use Simply Green. And the metal shavings that come off the edge, which you can wipe away with a rag. Students don't have to worry about flattening it or anything like that. And the idea of having 12 students in a class each one having to go walk over to the dry sharpening station, flatten the stone, then resharpen it. It creates a mess, go wash their hands, and then go back and get back to work. Versus this right here, you just spritz it, sharpen, wipe off, go back to work. You don't have those grits in your hand. It's not messy. It was a lot more efficient. But it's also an extremely expensive option. And again, it is a lifetime option. Whereas this is the second stone I've used, combination stone I've had in my, my years. But I have to mention this. Over the last year or two, I've noticed a lot of my professional people I follow and admire. Most people seem to be migrating to diamond stones if they're sharpening a whole bunch. Even though I do not get as good an edge 
off the diamond stones as I do that inexpensive water stone. But I get pretty close, and that might be close enough. And I think it just comes down to the convenience and less mess. But if I was just starting out in the craft, I would do, go one of two routes. I would either buy the combination water stone I, I've recommended for years, or just lately, I really do like the idea of just buying two small, solid, not those little paddle things, diamond stones, and then finding a method of honing afterwards. Now, in the sharpening realm, honing is where the magic happens for most of us that are working at a workbench and need to get on the higher end of the sharp scale in terms of tools. And basically, you use your stones to create an edge and shape an edge. And then you use the most ancient of sharpening materials, leather, to refine the edge and make it just perfect. This right here is the first strope I ever bought. And I bought it to go along with my mobile kit. And what it is, is you have a piece of leather on one side. This is the inside of the cow, and that's just kind of rough. And you put some kind of abrasive paste on it. And then you have the outside of the cow, which is fairly smooth, that just refines the edge. And a lot of the times you'll see it black because it gets impregnated with the steel that's coming off. This is not a new concept. In fact, if you've ever seen any old barber movie, you've probably seen a barber pull out something like this. It's got a little hook on it that they can put on a nail or the side of a chair, a little handle that they pull it tight, and then they will rub their razors on the back of the side. One side of it has the cow and it has some kind of abrasive paste on it. They'll shape it and then they will flip it over and then they'll put the final polish on it, go like that, and shape. Very rarely would you see somebody take that razor blade in the middle of the day to a stone to sharpen. Though they probably did at the beginning of the day to establish their edge and all day long after that they were just refining it. I myself have always used some kind of block. This is a piece of flattened uh, white oak that's quarter sawn so it'll be very stable where I glued on a rough side of the leather on one side and the fine side of the leather on the other side. And this is the one I used at my teacher's desk my entire time I was running a school and every student had one of these at their workbench. And the idea is that as you're using a tool, you know, every 20, 10, 20 minutes you come over, you come over to the horse side, you grab it over there, you kind of put it where you find your edge and then you would give it a good 20 strokes. Flip it over, do the same kind of 20 strokes, find your edge. And what's happening is you are somewhat compressing the leather and the friction is just kind of smushing the metal down until you get a nice little burr that you can feel. And then you just remove that burr. If you did just right, a lot of times you'll see a little sliver of light as you remove that burr. Just work it back and forth until it falls off. And this is what gets you the nice polished edge. This rivals those 8, 12, 16, 20,000 um, grit water stones in the shine and the quality of the edge you can get. And you can tell it's sharp because you should not be able to see that edge if you look straight down on it. Because light only reflects off of surfaces that are coming flat enough to come back at you. If there's any roundness or a nick, which I think this one has a few nicks in it, so you can tell the difference. Well, light will either reflect off of here or reflect off of there. If you see any glint of silver down the edge, you know you have a damaged section or it's dull. And this is now sharp enough that I can take shavings off of white oak with just pinky pressure. It's just amazing how sharp you can get off the most rudimentary sharpening appliance a hunk of leather now you can't do this forever this is kind of refining your work so that you don't have to go back to either the stones 
or a grinder, which is just another abrasive, just in a round form, to redefine your edge. It's much easier to maintain an edge than create an edge, and this is maintenance. And it's somewhat of a foundation of, you know, I did make a aluminum version of this that I would I sold. I might make them in the future, where I put the two different kinds of leather, the inside of the cow and the outside of the cow, plus some sandpaper, so that a beginner would have a means of doing the scary sharp system on one side and refining it on the other. I have heard, though, that the kind of leather that I like to use, which is cheap from the Tandy Center uh, offcut bin, or the scraps from a car upholster place, or any place that deals with leather, you can generally get their scraps for dirt cheap. Well, certain leathers will, that are thick, will compress a little bit, and they say it rolls over the edge. To me, that's not that big a deal, because if you have two angles, and this side rounds a little bit, all that does is create a slightly steeper angle at the cutting edge, which you can reset whenever you go back to the stones or anything like that. But I've been told lately that horse butt, genuine horse butt, is the leather that will compress the less, least. So it's the, the prized stuff to use as sharpening. So I did just pick this one up and I'll give it a go for a few, few months to see if that's really true. So that's how you can scratch yourself to an edge. Use some kind of abrasive to establish the edge and get you most of the way there. And then use a hunk of leather, which is something you can hold in your hand if you have a gouge and you need to get it into a little crevice or something like that, to refine it and maintain it so that you don't have to go back to the stones that often. Leather's cheap. Sandpaper is cheap, but you have to replace it all the time so that it's cheap to get into, expensive to maintain. Water stones, in my opinion, are some of the best values out there, especially if you get a combination stone, which they're generally a little bit more money, but it's cheaper than buying multiple stones. Same with oil stones. You don't have to get too many options with them. They're just a different form, plus oil doesn't rust your tools, so that's why a lot of people like it. And you don't have to maintain them as much as water stones. But diamond stones seem to be a way a lot of people are moving now and in the future simply because the price is coming down on them quite a bit and there's so much less maintenance with them. Plus the fact that when you're using powered options that can generate a lot of heat, well the fact that you're sitting on steel, well, that acts somewhat like a heat sink, which is why one reason why it's becoming so popular in places like turning and stuff like that. Plus the fact that you don't wear them out, uh, excuse me, you don't wear them down so they don't change their geometry and you're not having to constantly flatten them. So before we leave sanding and move on to slicing as a sharpening method, let's go ahead and sharpen something. Let me uh, grab my most commonly used budget chisel. Let's take a mill file and Yeah, that's dull. See, you can see the edge. And let's sharpen it up. Now, the first thing, right now we have our rough, our coarse, medium, fine, and super, super fine right there. But you also need to be able to establish the angle you want. Now, there are a lot of different jigs out there that you will see. Some of the more popular ones are something like this, this uh, one from Veritas. It has a roller on bottom, and you can place the chisel or whatever you're sharpening in here and tighten it up. The downside of this one is I've always found I always found it took so long because you basically have to slide this little bevel thing on the side. Then when you put your chisel in there, you find which angle you want, depth-wise, all these little settings, and you tighten it all up. Then you remove that piece, and now you have something that will find your angle. Other versions that people have made, uh, this one right here has a little twist thing where you can set the different angles on there. Then you put this in here and that's where you find your angles, how you want it. And then once again you roll it on the roll on a roller to find the angle. The one that I use when I do use the jig 
is probably the cheapest one. This is a knockoff of an Eclipse. And you'll notice that it has a top section, that's where you can put hand planes, and a bottom section, that's where you can put chisels. you notice that this side is round, and that side is square. So it actually pinches it in one spot to square it up over on this side. And what you would do is you will slide your chisel in there, and then you will have it protrude from this edge out a certain distance to create a certain angle. And on the sides, they give you that distance out there. But what I've done is for my chisels, I like it at 25 degrees, so I created this little stop. I just press it up against the stop right there, and that creates my distance. So there I can just tighten it up, and that has me a way to roll this back and forth and maintain that angle. But this is somewhat of a crutch to get establish angles, and it's not something you need even as a beginner. The general thinking is a lot of people got into this carefully measuring your angles because they found that at about 20 degrees, let me show you, zoom in, at about 20 degree angles, it would slice through wood very easily, but the edge was so weak that it folded over. At about 30, uh, 30 degrees, the edge was a lot stronger because the angle right there was the, uh, higher, but it's harder to push through. Which is why you will, a lot of times on chisels, you will find people going in between 30 and 20 degrees. I set mine about 25, just because it's in the middle, to find their edge. I found that 25 is a good compromise for me. But the lower it is, the more fragile that edge is, and the more work you're going to be having to do. By the way, most hand planes, they set theirs about 30 degrees. For the simple reason, the frog on the plane, this angle right here, is between 45 and 55 degrees. Well, if you have it at 45 degrees, there are chances the back of the chisel will run on the, run on the surface. So they do it at 30 degrees because that creates a little bit of clearance on the back side for wood to spring back. So it just cuts easier. That's just a common degree for hand planes. What I would do is, if a student is brand new, I would teach him to use this jig just to give them some confidence that they are going to get a good edge. But after that, what it is, is I grind mine on the a grinder and I have the platform set so it always gets the same angle. Then I can just come over here, I can rock back and forth. And you can actually feel when it touches both the bottom and top. I lock it into my wrist and then I raise it up a little bit by lifting my shoulder. It moves my whole body. And all that does is make sure that all I'm touching is the tip. I'm not touching the heel anymore. And that right there will allow me to focus all my sharpening on there. Now because I totally destroyed this edge, I'm going to start on the course. But most of the time I would do a few strokes here until I can feel a burr. And then I'll move over to the fine and then progress to the super fine. So what it looks like and what the amount of time it takes is I really did destroy this edge. So find my angle. Come over here in the course, lift up a little bit, then move it back and forth. And the only, I only go so far as I now feel burr all the way across it, which just means I've removed enough, enough material to fold the metal back a little bit. At that point, I can come over here, and normally I don't have to reset my angle with my wrist. Do the same exact thing. And after a little while, you will kind of learn how long it takes to get that burr and remove it. Now, by doing it by hand like this, there is a chance I could induce an angle. But you can only sharpen by hand so often before you have to remove so much material that you end up spending a lot of time here to do that one. So at which point, I will head back to my grinder and I will grind from grind it with that set platform and I'll remove the material in the middle and go almost to the edge. I never go to the edge on the grinder. And what that does, it resets both this angle horizontally and vertically. So right now, I've got my burr going, a very small burr going across. I'll put it on the back, sharpen it. Oh, did you just see that? Uh, 
little bit, of, there's a silver line on my finger. That's the burr that just came off. So I will come back, find that edge. And we'll just kind of work it back and forth. Then wipe it off. Be sure I wipe it very good. I do not want any kind of metal shavings being transferred to my leather. So let's try this horse butt. I've now... I've now done my grinding and shaping and created an edge. Now I'm going to hone the edge. And this is one of the things, I'll do this 20 times and then go back to the stones in normal use. Right here, just do 20 strokes. I'm going to do it on the soft, non-polished side a little bit. And we'll flip it over. Remove the burr. And then take a look at it. I wish I could zoom in closer. I just can't with my camera. It won't focus that tight. But you can see, I believe right about half of it you could probably see the burr still there a little bit. But no matter what, that is more than sharp enough for me to do any kind of bench work I need to do. So I talked that through it, even from the roughest state, me totally grinding that edge off on a mill file, what did that take us, maybe a minute? And most of the time it's only gonna take seconds to do something like that. And if you start out focusing on a little bit of the hand skills of adjusting it instead of using a jig because there are lots of different ways of doing jigs to hold things at a certain angle. You're going to learn that if you get close to the angle that you're shooting for, you're going to be okay. Plus or minus a couple of degrees is not going to make that big a difference. So now let's talk about slicing your way to an edge. And for the most part, when we are talking about slicing, we are talking about using files. And files, them being either a mill file or something like a triangle file, well, they're basically just steel that has been shaped with these edges and then hardened but never annealed. So they are very hard but very brittle. Whereas most of our woodworking tools, because we want to be able to sharpen them, they anneal them a little bit, which means they soften them a little bit via heat processing so that they can be sharpened. These kinds of tools can never be resharpened themselves because they're way too hard. And they're something we use quite a bit in woodworking, whereas you know a lot of us will use a mill file on our tools like axes, which don't have to have that mirror polish finish just to split wood. Whereas, you know, if we're using that same axe for carving or something like that, we might use a stone which will give us a little bit finer scratches. And what these do is, they're like little plain blades for metal. They take off shavings and not so much leave scratches. So they remove metal, they don't indent metal. Now a lot of times we are using mill files to flatten stuff and create edges on uh, single bevel tools like our axes or even lawnmower blades and stuff like that. And we would use a mill file for something like a handsaw to flatten all the teeth so that they're in the same plane. But to actually sharpen the teeth, we use these triangle saws, which have 60 degrees all the way around, which just so happens to be the common angle we cut into saw blades. Now saws are a tool that even I do not sharpen nearly enough. But I think it's kind of cool that they designed the saws, at least in the, Amer uh, the English style saws, to be, sharp to be used with the means that we sharpen them. The teeth are almost always cut so that the saw will fit perfectly in there. So all we really have to do is figure out the rotation of the saw and the angle of the saw we want to do, depending upon if we are sharpening a cross-cut saw or a, excuse me, a rip saw or a cross-cut saw. And then just size whichever triangle file you need per tooth, meaning you only want to fit in about halfway up the triangle that way you can use all three sides to sharpen your saw. Which means that 
you can sharpen your saw multiple times with one file because you're rotating around. Now these files do not last forever, but they are cheap and cheap, so you can consider them fairly disposable. And despite what you might think, sharpening a saw is really not that hard. It's just a matter of maybe pushing through each tooth two, maybe three times and doing evenly all the way across. And you don't have to re redo the flatness of the teeth every single time. Most of the time, I would just do a couple pass on underneath teeth and use that saw for another three or four months. Again, I don't sharpen nearly enough. Uh, in the old days, one of the first jobs most carpenters had was in the morning they would resharpen all the hand saws of all the people that were building in the, in the shop. And that's just kind of a entry level skill most people had, which tells you that the first job, the beginning job, the job they put the person with the least amount of skill was sharpening the crew's saws. It kind of tells you a lot of how much it actually requires to learn this skill. And being able to sharpen your saw means that that $40, $50 you spend on a nice, good quality saw, that's a lifetime investment. Whereas if you're having to replace your blades or if you buy a saw with teeth that are hardened that can't be resharpened, well then you end up spending more in the long run. Learning to sharpen saves you money. Also, I and other uh, YouTubers out there, we have whole videos on different ways to sharpen because you can make a lot of adjustments on a handsaw. I always call the handsaw the smartest tool in your arsenal. The hand plane is the dumbest, but it all comes down to who, who does a sharpening, who does a setting, who sets the angles and stuff like that because a, a well-sharpened saw is a dream to use. You practically have to force it to saw off a line. But unfortunately, most saws don't come from the factory sharp. You have to have to sharpen them before you use them for the first time. At least if you're buying the ones in my price range. Finally, let's talk about smooshing edges or folding metal in order to create an edge. Most commonly in our world, that's done when you're using some kind of scraper. Typically when you're using a scraper or sharpening a scraper, you take it and you use a mill file to remove the old edge. And you like to get it perfectly 90 degrees. You can use simple jigs like this, or you could just, you know, have a mill file and do it by hand. It's not that big a deal. But if you look in the mill file, you can actually see the shavings in there that are coming up. They just kind of roll up in there. You occasionally have to clean that out with either a brass brush or a nylon brush to get those, those shavings out. But once you do that one, you end up with a little bit of a burr off the get-go. That's actually enough for you to use a scraper. That burr is the wood the metal pushed off. And you can see you can get shavings with just that. But that is a very coarse shaving. That is not uh, something that's going to get you the finest of finishes. It's somewhat rough right there. That's kind of, in my mind, like using 220 sandpaper. What we really want to do is take that fresh edge and then we're going to fold it. What a lot of times you will do is you will lay it on the side of your workbench. Start with a burnisher. A burnisher is just a piece of metal that's harder than the metal you are trying to sharpen. It used to be old timers would use the side of a screwdriver or something like that. But that was back when they weren't using as good quality steel as we have today. Even the cheap stuff is fairly good quality. Nowadays, that would actually cut the screwdriver. So I'm using something, I think this is tungsten or magnesium or something like that. But what we've not done is by shaving that off, we actually have a little bit of a burr on the edge. We're going to take this, we're going to lay it down flat, and we're going to run it across. And we're kind of folding that burr over and around, and we're dulling this corner right here. We're kind of adding a bevel to it. We're compressing it down. Okay? And you can do that to all the sides all the way around. Generally, when you sharpen a scraper, do all the sides at once. That way you have eight different edges you can do. And if you look as you watch it, you probably see these little tiny shavings coming off. Because that's those burrs that were shaved off, 
sometimes when you're getting it down that edge they just slice off but right now I, I'm not gonna cut myself running my finger over here I've actually rolled that metal over like that if you're to look at it it would look like two little hook em horns on this edge right here so I'm now going to flatten those hook and horns and by doing that one it's going to compress out to the side a little bit so I take my edge I'm going to start dead flat pressing those hook and horns down and then notice I'm going to slowly come over like that so I'm now compressing that metal and it's folding over ever so slightly and do that all the way around and when you do that, when you have a much smaller burr, so now let's look at the shavings we make. See how much finer those are? And the surface itself that we're leaving behind is a lot shinier compared to what I did earlier. I mean, you can hear the difference. Lots, lots smoother. And if you are capable of learning to sharpen that little one dollar card scraper, imagine how much money you can save in sandpaper. I mean, there's four strokes and I just sanded all of that area. Glass smooth. Ready for shellac. So, learning how to do those three things, sand, slice, and smush, will pretty much allow you to sharpen any of the tools you own. But when you're first getting into woodworking, it's one of those deals that, yes, we all want to go out and buy the hand saws. We want to buy the chisels and stuff like that. But it's those accessories that you kind of have to also get at the same time. Because a chisel is only good for about hours of use before you really do need to resharpen it. And a lot of times a beginner woodworker won't know that their chisel needs to be resharpened. So they'll start doing dangerous stuff like putting more pressure into it. So as you're looking to acquire tools, the main thing I want you to remember is that sharpening just about any tool out there is really pretty simple. You just have to have a little bit of tools to do that one. So when you buy the chisel, Make sure you also buy the stone to sharpen it. Having said that, there are some tools, you know, like your table saw blades and band saw blades and all that kind of stuff that are easier off being sent off to be sharpened or just not even, just disposed of. Uh, I do know that my band saw blades, my 14 inch band saw, they run me $13 and they'll last me a good month. 13 bucks a month is a, is a inexpensive cost to me for as much as I use that tool. Table saw blades, a lot of times those are disposable because they got carbide tips and a lot of us don't have the uh, tools to sharpen carbide properly. So, and they're not that expensive unless you get the very high quality ones. And what, one of the things that makes them high quality is that they are able to be resharpened. So you can put them back in their package and a lot of times the original manufacturers will have a sharpening service. There are also tools like hand saws. And I'm, I'm going to go against myself right here. I believe that the first time you get a handsaw resharpened, send it off to an expert. Uh, I know Lee Nielsen, if you buy one of their saws, you can send it back to them and they will resharpen. There's a, lots of services out there. Go online, ask for some reviews of the person who is doing the sharpening. Make sure that they know what they are doing because the the ability of the sharpener on the effectiveness of a handsaw is extreme. It's not an overly complex thing and it's something you could learn very easily, but as a new woodworker, I would really like you to experience what a well sharpened saw feels like. And if you're sharpening your own saw the first time, you might do it perfectly. But odds are you'll probably get, you know, 50, 60 percent perfect and you won't really know it. Whereas if you, you have it sharpened by a pro first, you will know what a good saw feels like. And then when you resharpen it, you go, oh, I almost made it there. So next month when you try sharpening again, which will take you five minutes, you'll get a little closer. And the next time, a little closer. And probably the three, third or fourth time, you're going to be really happy with the way you're sharpening your saw. 
You can almost say the same thing about chisels, but chisels are so easy to sharpen. Just go for it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video exploring the sanding, slicing, and smushing aspects. Those are my terms. Uh, and aren't going to be afraid of sharpening your own tools. It is not a black art, witch's art, or anything like that. You can do it. It is not complex. And if you are slightly off, the religious gods shouldn't be getting on to you for that one. It'll still cut as long as you get two angles going to infinity. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. And remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Be safe, have fun, and make your tools sharp.